Allison from Learning at the Primary Pond. I'm a literacy specialist and I'm so excited because in this video we are going to go over a complete small group lesson from start to finish. And this is a lesson that you might teach kind of like toward the beginning or maybe the middle of first grade. But honestly, there's so many elements that you can also use if you teach kindergarten or second grade. It's very adaptable, and while I go through this, I'm gonna be explaining to you why I do these certain things, and also giving you options, because I feel like no, you know, one, no two groups of students are the same, no two teachers are the same. I want you to have options just as far as like how you do the lesson and how you can adapt it. So I will definitely give you lots of different ideas. Speaking of different grade levels, if you're just joining me, I would love for you to type in the chat what grade you teach. That really helps me just kind of like tailor what we're talking about and I can talk about different grade levels, um, but it helps a lot to know who's here. So please go ahead and let me know your grade level in the comments. And also even if you can just hear me okay, normally I do this at my computer downstairs, but doing it somewhere else today. So let me know if you can hear me as well. Hey, Christy, kindergarten, amazing. So glad you could be here. Anna, grade one, virtually, wow, awesome. So we got kinder, grade one accounted for. I bet we'll have some second grade teachers as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into the lesson. Like I said, this is for small group. Now, can you do decodable text in a whole class setting? Yeah, absolutely you can. You can have it be part of like your phonics lesson. The reason why I like to do it in a small group setting though is because it just lets me coach the kids more closely. And if we're reading a text whole group, um, it's probably not likely that it's necessarily a good fit for all the kiddos. So that's why even if you teach phonics in a whole group setting, I really recommend if you're doing some decodable text follow-up to do that in a small group setting so that you can better meet kids' needs. I think I also forgot to mention, something I wanted to mention was that these books, now I have decodable text in my phonics program, From Sounds to Spelling. You can go to fromsoundstospelling.com after we're done if you wanna learn more about that. But these that I'm showing you today are actually from some separate decodable text bundles that I have on TPT and they are on sale this week, yay. All right, let's see, Janet, K5EL, amazing. Elizabeth, hey, grade two, Brenda. Reading Intervention, K3. If you're just joining me, come on in, say what grade you teach. Looks like we have a really good mix. Awesome. Okay, so we're gonna go through this lesson. And like I said earlier, I think I said this earlier, this is gonna be kind of like an early-ish to mid first grade lesson, but you can absolutely adapt for K for a second. I'll explain why I do each component to help you adapt. And the skill that we're gonna be focusing on is initial R blends. So a consonant blend, two or three letters that are blended together. The letters retain the sounds. You might have, you know, TR, DR, GR, FR, whatever else, right? Kids don't, can you see that? Okay, you can see that, okay. Um, kids don't necessarily need to memorize all the blends, but what they need to become proficient at is blending the sounds to read them, right? And this is typically like a graduation after kids can read CBC words, like, you know, for example, uh, had, right? That's a CBC word. And then we add another letter, trap, right? Now we're up to four letter words, four phoneme words too, okay? So that's the skill that we're gonna be working on. And for the purposes of this lesson, we are assuming that the kids have already learned about R blends. So this has been introduced to them, whether again, it's whole group or it's small group, they have had some experience with R blends. They probably have read some words with R blends maybe built or written some words with R blends. And so now what we want them to do in this lesson is apply that concept to be able to read the text. So this is not how I introduce R blends. This is kind of like a follow-up and some instruction would have happened beforehand. All right, Cassie's tagging a friend, amazing. Thanks for sharing. Wow, we've got all sorts of grade levels here, great. Okay, so starting the lesson, I'm just gonna imagine that you all are my students and I would have you come to the small group table, you would sit down and I'm gonna have a basket for each group. And in that basket, I have the materials that I want you to work on in this lesson. And really what I do is I load it up for the entire week. So we may not be doing everything in this basket today, um, but what I will do is I want you to imagine that I have some like baggies of books 
And these are other like decodable texts that we've read previously. This is not a new book for today in this imaginary lesson. You've read this previously. And so I'm going to put some options, at least two options on the table. So you as my students are sitting down, you get to choose a book. And I'm, you know, I'm saying hi to you, but I'm not really like interacting much or starting the lesson because while you are rereading these decodable texts, which by the way is so good for fluency, they need to read these more than once. Do not have your kids read a decodable text just one time. They got to reread. Even if they're in second grade, it helps build fluency. Um, so anyway, you're rereading this text. And meanwhile, I'm going to have one of my students right here next to me. It's a student that I've intentionally chosen from the group. And they're going to do one of two things with me. Number one, they could be rereading me. Well, okay, one of three things. They could be rereading the decodable text. Like maybe this is what we read in our last lesson. They're going to read it to me. I'm going to take a running record. If you're not familiar with running records, you're, it just basically means like you're taking notes on the words that they read correctly and incorrectly so that you can see, for example, are they struggling with short vowels? Are they self-correcting when, when what they read doesn't make sense? You're watching for those reading behaviors and the phonics skills, and you can learn so much from them. So my star student that I call them, and you can actually put like a little star sticker on your small group table and like tape it on there. So, oh, you're going to be the star student today. It just makes it a little more fun. So I'm kind of like off to the side reading with them. It could also be, I mentioned there were three options. It could also be a brand new text, if that's something I wanted to do. If I wanted to see how they could do without any support, without any practice, I could give them a new text. So it could be a reread, a new text, or if there's like a phonics quick check or even just a couple of words that I want them to read or spell, I could do that as well. That I do less frequently. What I do most frequently is just a reread from the previous lesson to kind of see how they're doing. So I do that with my star student. Meanwhile, the other kids are reading the book and they have some choice. They have, you know, maybe like two or three different books from previous lessons. So there is choice, which is motivating. Um, so they are reading. I was going to tell you something. No, I forgot. They're rereading the text. Oh, I think what I was going to tell you was that when this kiddo, my star student, is reading with me, they don't necessarily have to read the entire book. They can if we have time, but like with second graders, you know, they're reading texts that are a little bit longer. So we may only get through, you know, a paragraph. That is fine. We want this initial part of the lesson to be pretty quick, right? The kids get to practice their fluency while I'm getting some assessment data. We don't want to take more than just a couple of minutes because they've still got to read the new book or at least starting the, to start to read the new book for today. Okay, so that happens first. Um, I would love for you to let me know right now in the chat, do you do any fluency work like this in your small group? Do you have them come and reread text? You can either just type yes or no, or if you have an idea to share the way you do it, feel free to type that as well. I'm curious if you sneak in any fluency practice like I do. Okay, so that happens relatively quickly. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna gather up all the books, put them back in our little basket. Christy says yes, very similar, amazing. And now I'm going to start working toward the new book. And um, ideally, we're going to do some sort of like quick review or practice to set them up to be successful in the text. And so as I mentioned at the beginning, we are doing a lesson that practices our blends. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write, let's see if I can write it so you can actually read it. I'm going to write a word that has an initial R blend right here. And I'm going to just point it out to them and say, okay, don't want you to tell me what this word says yet. I want you to notice that R is the second letter here and we have the letter T. And I'm going to see if they can remember like, oh yeah, this is an R blend. And if they don't remember, I'll just remind them, hey, this word has an R blend in it. We've got another consonant blended with the R. The, you know, the letters keep their same sounds, but we blend them together. We talk about the letter smoothie, <laughs> making a letter smoothie with the blender. Um, we blend them together. And then, you know, when we're blending to read the word. So we just kind of review what an initial R blend is. And again, they have seen this before. This is not brand new. I'm not introducing this concept in this particular lesson. We're just applying the concept to real reading, which is really important that in context practice. Let's see, Emily says I have them read Raz Kids. Jesus says, no, need to learn how for fluency. Honestly, the fluency practice that I was mentioning, just having them reread is perfect. Simple, no prep on your part, right? You just keep it in their basket, like I mentioned. 
Okay, so not to distract myself, I have put this word on the board. I told them, hey, I don't want you to read it. We reviewed what a consonant blend is. And now what I say to them is we are gonna say the sounds in blend. So t or app trap, right? So they would be doing that with me. Or if I'm like, hey, they got this, I'm gonna point, they're gonna read, and that's it. Now I'm gonna do this with another word as well. And I might ask them a question like, hey, this is another R blend at the beginning, but what letter is blended with the R here? That's that F, right? So then I'm gonna have them blend to read again, the word, so now they've read trap and frog. And the reason, first graders, why I asked you to read these words is because today we have a story called Frog and the Trap. Like I mentioned earlier, this is from my decodable text bundles on TPT, have them for kinder first and second. Those are on sale this week. So I'm gonna show them this and I'm gonna say, okay, let's look at the cover, what do you see? So I wouldn't have given them their books by this point, I don't want them like looking through and getting distracted. I want them focused on the cover because when I introduce the text, I need to maybe provide a little background knowledge, have a quick discussion, but it can't take all day because again, they still have not read the text yet, right? So, okay, so what do you see on the cover? They may be able to name frog, crab, and trap, right? And I'll ask them, okay, well, what is a trap? Where have you seen a trap in a book, in a movie, um, in real life? So I want them to kind of understand like, you know, what a mouse trap is, or I just want them to have some context of how that works. Now, if I'm working with English language learners, which I know at least one of you do, because <laughs> I saw it in the chat, um, if you work with English language learners or there's a concept that you feel like is gonna be so foreign to them, have an iPad or some sort of tablet and, or even just your laptop, pull up a picture or a short video clip on YouTube, obviously preview it ahead of time, and show them this text that has to do with whatever concept you are talking about. Because sometimes, like this book I think is fine. If you look at the photo here, uh, you can kind of see what you know is going on with the trap and they can make some predictions. But if there's a concept that you know is not gonna be clearly explained by the pictures in the text, or if you're using something like a passage, this is just a passage version of the same text, you can always just look it up, show them something briefly on your iPad and move on. So like I said, I'm gonna ask them for predictions. What do you predict is gonna happen in the story? We're not gonna talk about this all day. It's just gonna be a couple of kids. I want them to know what a trap is and that's it, okay? The only other thing that I'm gonna do before they read is I'm gonna pre-teach a word. Before you read a decodable text, you, sorry, before you read a decodable text with a group of students or your students, you want to read it yourself and you want to read it with the lens of are there any words that the kids will not yet be able to decode? Uh, it could be high frequency words that maybe you haven't taught yet. Um, the, the, this is true for even leveled text. Whatever text you're using, read it ahead of time and be prepared for the words that maybe have phonics patterns that you just haven't covered yet. The kids wouldn't be able to decode or there's a high frequency word and they haven't been taught it yet. I think the term decodable text can be misleading, even though obviously I use it. Like I said, I've got my decodable text bundles, but I feel that it can be misleading because when you say decodable, I say decodable for who or whom, right? Because, you know, kindergarten students, could they decode this? A lot of them, no. Could first grade students? Yeah. Second grade students? Yeah, right? It just depends on the abilities of the kids. You might have a fourth grader that this text is not decodable for them because they're a little bit behind in their reading. So decodability depends on the reader and it also falls on a spectrum. Texts are not decodable or not decodable, right? I don't know if I said that very clearly, but you it's not that a text, yes, it's decodable or no, it's not decodable. It's on a spectrum. There's a range, right? You could have words that the kids mostly can decode. You could have words that's not very, you know, there's not, not a ton of words that are decodable, so it's just a spectrum. So, decodable text. <laughs> you want to read them before, just like level text, before you give it to the kiddos, so that you can anticipate words that they won't yet be able to decode. If they don't know the words, or they don't have the phonics knowledge to decode them, just pre-teach those words. You don't want there to be like, you know, tons of words, like five or ten or something, but in this text, there is the word O, and in the lesson plan that goes with this one, that's in my decodable text bundle, I have you just teach the word to them ahead of time. 
So I'm doing a lot of talking, but this is going much quickly, much more quickly in the actual lesson. So we've discussed, you know, a little bit about what the text is going to be about. We've talked about a trap. And then I'm going to say, hey, you know what, first graders, when you're reading, you're going to notice this word. And this word is O. And I might even at this point, like pass out their books and have them find the word O and read it. The reason why I'm just telling it to them is because it might trip them up. And the real work of the book, yes, comprehending, but it's to use their phonics knowledge to decode with this decodable text. So I don't need them wasting time trying to figure out that word. I can just tell it to them and move on. No big deal. That's why we always want to preview whatever text the kids are reading, especially when they're beginning readers, so that we really fully understand what they're going to be able to do and what they might not be able to do. Okay, so we're going to pre-teach O, um, and then I'm just going to give them the text. If I haven't already, they're going to turn to the beginning, and they are going to whisper read the text. Um, let's see. Let me, Tracy, let me answer your question. So do you use these as your guided reading books? You absolutely can. Yeah. So when kids are first learning to read, um, decodable texts are really what will get them moving in the right direction. The lesson that I'm showing you can really be considered like a guided reading lesson, although people define guided reading differently. So I'm just calling it a small group lesson. But yes, Tracy, long story short, you can definitely use these as your guided reading books. You just want high quality ones like this has an actual storyline. It's engaging. So you just want to be choosy about the decodable text that you use. But yes, absolutely. There is comprehension work we can do, as you'll see a little bit later on. Okay, so now the kids get their books and they're going to whisper read. If I want to um, hear a child reading, I'm just going to like move in a little closer, right? Or when my kids are independently like silent reading, maybe in second grade or later on in first grade, I will just gently touch the table in front of them, like light tap, if I want them to read out loud to me. But at this stage in the game, first graders, this skill, I'm just going to be having them whisper read. They're going to whisper read the text. Now, with some groups of kids, you can give them the text, just like I mentioned, they whisper read and they're good to go. But some kids are going to need a little bit more support, right? You can actually read the same text with different groups, but provide different levels of support. 100%. I do it all the time. But you can also, you know, allow each group to be successful by just varying, like, how much help you give them. So let's talk about different ways that you might give help. One way is to pull out another word from the text that you really feel like might be hard for them, another word or two, and decode it as a group. So let's say that you believe that the word trip is going to trip them up, no pun intended. Um, maybe the TR blend is hard for them. So as a group, you know, you say the sounds, trip, trip, you blend, right? And so when they get to it in the book, hopefully that's going to make it easier. So decoding a couple of the words ahead of time can help. Now, if you happen to work with older kids, something you might do is have them um, break up a multisyllabic word or two. So like for many second graders, this would be easy, but what if, I don't know, there's like a, some sort of word in the text that's two syllables, and like here this season even has an R blend. Can you see that? It says tantrum. So if you're working with a second grade group and you have this word in the text, it's not in this text, just giving you an example, what you might do instead with this group is have them help you divide up the word into the syllables and blend to read each syllable and then the entire word. So a little bit of decoding work. Again, with some groups, you don't have to do any at all. You know your students, you want to be kid watching and you know choosing what your lesson is like based upon their needs. Okay, so that's one way to provide support is just by going over a couple of extra words with them. Um, other ways to provide support, you could read the first page or two with them or to them, and then they have to read the rest of the text on their own. Um, let me know in the chat right now, do you ever do an echo read? Choral read with your students as support. Just type yes if you do and no if you've never tried that before. Now the goal is always for the kids to read the text on their own. If I can help it, I don't want to do an echo read, I don't want to do a choral read, but if I have to maybe read the first page to them and like do some modeling of blending, I will. But again, this needs to go fast. 
me talking to you about this lesson is taking much longer than the actual lesson would take, right? We have to be quick with this. Christy says, usually no, the goal is not to, right? Erin, yes, sometimes you have a group that just needs it and that's the way it is. Okay, so they're reading the text, right? Um, oh, another support you could do is just have them read half the text. If this is going to be very slow going for them or if you find out, surprise, it's not going so well. Just have them read to like, there's seven pages in here, have them read to like page three or four and then stop, discuss, maybe do a little decoding practice and then either the next day or later, if you have time, they can finish. So, so many options for support. Pre-teach words or, you know, work on some decoding beforehand, read the first page or two to them. Um, Coral read maybe a page or two, try to limit that as much as possible read only half of the text, just so many options. And this is not just applicable to first grade or kindergarten. Like I mentioned with that example of tantrum, you can divide up some multisyllabic words and that will help your second graders or your more advanced students as well, not just second grade. Okay, so those are our options reading the text. Let's imagine that the kids are now reading. Um, I am watching, I am kid watching. <laughs> this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for, well, how are they doing with our blends? Are they really grasping it? Um, are they applying that knowledge? Because sometimes, let me know in the chat if this ever happens to you, sometimes you'll go over a phonics skill and then you're like, okay, read this book with, you know, this type of word and the kids don't get it, right? <laughs> and they're not always able to apply it. So I'm looking, are they applying this skill? How are they doing? At this stage in the game, I'm also looking, how are they doing with their short vowel sounds? Are they on track? Are they, you know, confusing any of those? I'm looking for that. I'm also looking, are they monitoring for meaning? Of course, we want them to be using their phonics skills and decoding, but if they're reading things just kind of like robotic and it doesn't make sense and they don't go back and fix it, then that's a problem, right? So we want them to be monitoring to make sure that something makes sense that they've read and if it doesn't, to go back and try to fix it. So we're monitoring for that as well. I wanna see, are they guessing at words? Are they reading through each word? If they're guessing at a ton of words or just like, trying way too hard to figure out what it says from the picture. What you can do in the decodable text bundles that are on sale this week, these have it, like this is literally the same text right here. You can just give them a passage version. The second grade bundle only has passages just to save paper, but like with the kinder and first grade bundle, there are passage versions for every little book. So if your kids are going wild with guessing, you know, you can just have them read the passage instead. So that's what I'm watching for with the kiddos. I'm also coaching them, giving reminders as needed, but getting them to do as much of the work as possible. If a child is stuck on the word, the first thing I do, stuck on a word, the first thing I do is nothing. I wait. I watch them. If they look at me, if I happen to be, you know, right there reading with them because there's multiple kids, if they look at me, I kind of go like this. I like nod and smile. And I'm looking at the word because I don't want to train them that, hey, they're looking at me to, to get help. I want to show them, hey, you need to focus on the word. So I put my eyes on the word to hopefully get them to focus and just kind of like nod, you know, like I'm here to support them, but like I want to see what they can do. So that's what I'm doing um, while they're reading. They finish the text. Next up, we're going to do a little simple retelling. At the very beginning of the year, I have to do a lot of modeling. I have to do a lot of, okay, what happened next? What happened next? The goal, though, is for the kiddos to eventually um, have something where I will choose a student leader. That student leader will start the retelling first, such and such happened. They then call on another student in the group to continue the retelling. And then, you know, a few different kids take turns and together the group constructs what happened in the text. Obviously, especially at the first grade level, this takes a little bit of time. It does not happen overnight for sure. You may have to give prompting and support but it is something that you can strive for even with kindergarten. Kindergarten, it takes a lot longer, but you can get there. You want the kids to be able to get a basic retelling of what happened in the story. Now with second grade, you know, a more advanced grade, you may want to aim for more of like a summary, like they're telling you the, the more important parts, but it really just depends on the level of your students. You need to do some kind of retelling or summarizing note just to make sure that they actually understood what happened, what they read, and see if, if, they, if one child says something that's incorrect, see if they can correct each other. Don't, it's so tempting, we wanna help our kids, but don't just like leap in and try to save them. See if they can correct each other's retelling. 
after we do the retelling, I'm going to ask a couple of higher order or more challenging thinking questions um, for this text, what it's about. I know I haven't even talked about it yet, but this frog finds some ham in a trap. He's like, how do I get this out? I want to eat this ham. And so he brings it to his friend Crab, who has the little like pinchers or whatever. And the crab opens the trap and they eat ham and live happily ever after. So the, one of the higher order thinking questions that I have in the lesson plan here is just, was it a smart choice to bring the trap to crab? Why or why not? It's not like right there in the text question, right? It's kind of going above and beyond and we'll discuss. And then I'll also ask, how did crab feel about opening the trap and how do you know? So it's almost like inferring, right? Using text evidence as well. So obviously at the lower levels, the higher order thinking is a little bit more limited. If you have a really basic book, you know, ask them, you know, how else could the story have ended or what would you add to the book? But we just, we want to go beyond just a retelling. We want to, you know, elevate their thinking a little bit as well. Okay, so at this point, and again, this would be <laughs> pacing much faster because I'm talking a lot and telling you what I'm doing and why. At this point, I want to attend to any words that I noticed really tripped the kids up when they were reading. Let me know, just say yes if you do this in the chat. Let me know if after you read a text, you ever choose some words that were hard for the kids and then go over them together. Just say yes in the chat if that's something you do and no if it's something that you haven't tried yet. So you notice that right after we finish the text, I do talk about the content of the text um, because I want to drive home the point that the purpose of reading is to understand. So that's what we talk about first, but now what we're gonna do is highlight some words that may have been tricky for them. So one of the words in this text was fresh, okay? And for some kids that might've been fine, but maybe I noticed like one or two kiddos, they really struggled with this word. I see Christy says yes, Kimberly says yes, Tracy says yes, some yeses. I think this is such a valuable thing to do because you get that good information about what they're reading and then you can help them apply. Like this word do does happen to have an R blend in it, but there might be a skill that you taught previously that you're like, uh oh, they're not applying it anymore. So you need to come back and review. So what the kids get wrong is just like a great source of information for us. So let's say they struggled with fresh. I might put it up on the board and I might say, okay, first graders, I notice in I spy in this word, a consonant digraph. They've already learned consonant digraphs. Can you find the consonant digraph? So hopefully they'll tell me that it's SH and I'll remind them, I'll say, you know what? In a consonant digraph, these are two letters that are best friends. They're working together to make one sound, right? What does the S and the H say when they're together? This is different first graders from a consonant blend. In a consonant blend like FR, you still hear the th and the R for the each letter, right? They're not working together to make one sound, they're two separate sounds. So we have to think about that when we are reading the word. So the sounds here, we got one sound, two sound, three sounds, four sounds. So let's blend to read the word, right? I'll point, they'll say the sounds, and we'll blend to read it, okay? So we're applying that phonics knowledge. We're also attending to what they got wrong or what they weren't able to do yet. So that's a really valuable thing to do. I usually don't do more than like two words here. Um, if they really, really struggled, I probably would have stopped them halfway through. So if there's, if you're finding that there's just like a ton of words that you need to go over, then, you know, A, look at the types of books you're giving them and B, consider just stopping halfway through and just doing half the text per lesson. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. And then at this point, I've gotten through the, the main like meat of the lesson, right? So if you're just joining me now, this should be posted to the page and you can rewatch later, but they sat down, we did a little fluency practice, I did a little assessment with one kiddo. Um, we kind of reviewed the R blends, got them ready to read, introduced the text, pre-taught a word, they read the book, we did comprehension, we pulled out you know some examples from the text, that maybe they struggled with. And at this point, now it just depends like what other skills you wanna work on. This is a decodable text, so it's a really good opportunity to work on them applying their phonics knowledge to their reading, which they've already done, but we wanna make sure they're really seeing that connection. And so often what I'll have them do is just say, okay, now I want you to find in your book any words that have R blends in them. So what you can do, did I bring my whiteboard? No, that's fine. Um, I have something here. 
So what you can do is if they have, you know, a book that you want them to write in, they can actually highlight or underline or circle the words with R blends. If you don't want them to write in it, no big deal. They can use a piece of scratch paper or they can use a little whiteboard to make a list. First graders can write slowly so they don't have to find all the examples. Give them a limited amount of time. How many words can you find? And then they're done. Um, if you, one option is like maybe you have like a nice set of your decodable text printed in color like I have here, but then maybe like with my decodable text bundles, you use the passage version for them to write on. So you could potentially do this in your small group lesson and then give this to them to write on. They can also use this text for rereading they can potentially take it home. So a lot of teachers, they'll either start with the book and then give them this to work with, or they'll start with a passage, and then sometimes they give them the book to take home. So you can use it really flexibly. Okay, what was I saying? Oh, I was saying that the kids are going to find examples of our blends. There's a lot of ways for them to do it on a whiteboard, by circling, highlighting, whatever. You can switch it up from time to time too, just to keep it fresh. Okay, so that is one thing you can do. I should also mention that if you feel that before the kids read the book, they're really going to need to be reminded of like what an R blend is and they're going to need some support, you can actually have them do that activity before they read the text. I often do this when I'm teaching digraphs or vowel teams, a more advanced skill. Um, with digraphs, kids have to learn to not just say like, K -h -h. they have to say ch. Right? And so with digraphs, I want them to look before they read and just kind of do a word hunt. This is not the, this was the example book that they might have read in a previous lesson, but I want them to do a word hunt and like highlight or whatever the words that have the digraph so that when they read the book, their brains are prepared. They're like, oh, I know what to do with that. So you can do this little word hunt activity either before or after they read the text. Totally up to you. Um, if you have ever had your kids do a word hunt during small group, just tell me yep in the comments. Curious if other people do that as well. All right, let's see. What do we have next? Okay, so that is one thing they can do. They could even do it after your small group. Like, okay, we're done with small group. Now you go do it on your own as a center. So that's an option. Um, you can also have them do some writing. In the decodable text bundles, the like written response questions are set up so that the kids are required to use words that have, in this case, R blends. So they're using, they're writing the words with the target phonics pattern. And of course, you can do that on the passages. They could do it on whiteboards. If you want them to keep the book, you can staple the little, you know, writing thing that we have here. So many options. Just have them write a sentence or two about the text. Second graders may be able to write a little more. Now I'm throwing out options here. You may not necessarily be able to do all of them. I never am able to do all of them. I just wanted to give you some different options and ideas, things that are very simple and don't require a lot of prep that you can quickly do after your small group. When I'm figuring out what I wanna do post read, A, it depends on how much time I have. B, it depends on my literacy block as a whole. If I'm really hitting writing hard during other parts of the day, I'm like, nah, I don't really need to fit writing in, right? I might focus on phonics. Or if my phonics instruction and phonics work is like outstanding, tons of time, then maybe I will focus on writing or something else, right? It just depends on your literacy block as a whole. Don't feel like you have to fit it all into small group instruction because there's different parts of the day that they're getting that in. So we're talking about options, the word hunt. I see Kimberly said, does a word hunt with high frequency words? Yes. I'm not even talking about high frequency words here, but you could absolutely integrate some practice with that as well. I could have done flashcards with high frequency words at the beginning, just a couple. They could have done a word hunt with high frequency words. Thank you for mentioning that, Kimberly. Okay, so that's an option. Writing is an option. Um, we could also build some words that have R blends. And there's actually two different ways that you can do this, okay? So let's say that I want them to do this for purposes of encoding. Encoding meaning being able to take sounds and turn them into like written words, print, right? So that could be writing, it could be building words. If that's what I want to target, then I am going to have some R blend words prepared already, written down in my lesson, and I'm going to guide the kids through building those words. They are each going to need to have a set of this, okay? 
I used to like pick out the exact letters that they would need and that took forever and I never felt like <laughs> I was always like scrambling to get it ready for a small group time so I really prefer for them just to have this whole little thing. It takes them a while to learn the little ones how to keep it organized but if you're really like on them they will learn to keep it organized um, and you can also like underneath here I don't have it but you can you know write the letter so they know where to put everything back. So anyway they're each going to have a set of this if you're doing this activity and what we're going to do is I'm not just let's see I want them to do the word grab. I'm not just necessarily going to say grab and then they go build it. Because we're working on R blends I anticipate that getting some of these R blends might be a little tricky. Sometimes, let me know if you have this happen as well, kids will miss a sound when they're transitioning from like learning, you know, to see from learning to read CBC words to reading words with blends. Because there's like that extra sound there, right? Three phonemes to four phonemes. So I'm going to draw these Elkonin or sound boxes on the board. I'm going to say, okay, first graders, we're going to make the word grab. I want you to grab a snack before we go. Say grab. They say grab. You always want them saying it. And I'm going to say, okay, now I want you to tell me the sounds in grab. So while they're telling me the sounds, I'm going to tap each box. So they should say g or ab, grab, okay? If, and this might happen, they say g, ab, I'll say, uh-oh, we have one extra box. I think we missed a sound. Let's try it again. So these four boxes serve as a scaffold, a reminder that there are supposed to be four sounds in this word. Now, if they're very proficient with R blends or whatever skill we're working on, you don't have to do this. This I just picked for this lesson because R blends or consonant blends in general can be tricky and kids may miss a sound. Even your second graders, maybe you're working on three letter blends like SCR, right? You may need to use boxes with them, even if they're pretty proficient readers and writers, because it's very easy for them to forget a sound. So anyway, tangent aside, <laughs> we're going to say the sounds in the word, and then I'll say build it. Now, if you have kindergartners or kids who just need a lot more help, you might need to go sound by sound through the word. You might need to say, okay, what was the first sound? G. But then they have to find the G and build it. All right, let's say the sounds again. G or ab. What was the second sound? And they find the R, whatever. So you can go letter by letter. Generally, I try not to, but with kinders or if it's a tricky skill, you may need to. So that is an encoding activity. However, you can also use magnetic letter tiles. And I see somebody was asking me. Um, I have made them before, Janet, but also this is an option that I got from Amazon. I think if you just type in, I don't remember the company name. I don't think it's on here, but if you just type in magnetic letter tile, see if you can find it. It was on Amazon that I got it. Okay, so that was the encoding version. You can also do a decoding version. If you really feel like um, building the words, we're going to do that, but even just decoding is hard right now, you can say, okay, I want you to, for example, and TR can be tricky, take the letter T, now take the letter R, now take the letter I, now take the letter M. Okay, so you can actually tell them what letters to pull. This is the decoding version of this. And then they have to say each sound, t or I, n, trim, and read the whole word. Okay, now with this version, what you can do is say, okay, now I want you to take out the I and swap it for the letter A. Now blend to read, what word did you make? Tram. You turn trim into train. So you can have them, and then like maybe um, you take the T away, and you put a G. So you can have them like manipulating the sounds, which is really good. But in this case, they are reading the words. That is just another option instead of building the words. Again, it just depends on, you know, what other opportunities have they had to practice reading versus writing words in your phonics block. Um, no one activity is, you know, perfect. It just depends on what else you got going on. So that would be building words. Just putting my letters back here. Um, again, this is just an option. We're not going to do all of these things for sure. You could have them writing words on boards. You could actually draw the Elkonin boxes for them ahead of time. I've actually seen, I've never bought these, but I've actually seen whiteboards that actually have sound boxes on them, which is pretty cool. I don't remember where I saw them, but 
somewhere I saw them and it was cool, but you can draw this for them beforehand. You could even just like put this on a little strip of paper, uh, laminate it, and then they can write on it with a marker. So that's an option if they need that support, but a plain old whiteboard is fine too. You know, do the same thing where you have them, you know, tap out the sounds or they can tap like this and then they write the word. You want them to practice segmenting before they write. So whiteboards is another option. Um, another option, last option I'm throwing out here, and again, you're not going to do all of these, would be to work on some nonsense words. Sometimes you'll find that kids are just memorizing words because they see them so often, which, you know, I mean, it's, they're learning them, they're learning them to cite words, which is fine. Like that's what happens when we learn to read. We recognize so many words so much more quickly and we don't have to decode every single word, which is a good thing. But if our kids are relying on memorizing, then if they get to a new word that they don't know, which will inevitably happen, it happens to us as adult readers too, they're not necessarily going to know what to do. So reading nonsense words essentially forces them to use their blending, decoding skills, or phonics skills to read a word because they've never seen it before. So for example, I'm just going to make up a nonsense word. I'm going to use one with our blends because that was our skill, right? So not a real word to my knowledge. And so they would have to read g or up, drop. So you could have them practice applying their, you know, their skills with our blends to read nonsense words as well. So I've given you a lot of options, but the nice thing is like once you have whiteboards or once you have these, it doesn't take any prep. I, let's see, what are we talking about? We talked about, um, we talked about the word hunt, right? Finding examples of the R blends in text. Um, we've talked about writing. They could write a sentence or two. We talked about building words, reading words, writing them on the whiteboard, reading nonsense words. So you have so many different options. They're all good options. Again, you just want to think across your week, across the literacy block, are they getting a lot of opportunities to decode words and encode en words? So read and spell. You kind of want to balance the two, right? They, they need opportunities to do both. Okay, so this took us about 40 minutes, but this is actually happening in a small group setting in around 15. I was trying to give you my why behind why I do certain things, and that's why it took longer, but I do hope that this was helpful, and I hope that it just gave you some simple ways to get kids applying their phonics knowledge with decodable text. Lots and lots of different perfect or good ways to do your lessons, but I hope this was one good example for you. Just like I mentioned at the beginning, of this um, little video here. My decodable text bundles on Teachers Pay Teachers, those are discounted this week, I believe through the end of the day on Thursday. So it's just for a couple of days. Um, so if you wanna grab those, there should be a link there. I can do a little link here as well. Those have a huge discount. For Kinder, you do get the book and you get the passage for first grade, same thing. For the second grade bundle, I believe that you just get the passages, was trying to save paper and also help them feel a little bit more grown up. So you get the passages for second. They also come with lesson plans um, to really just walk you through doing all this kind of stuff. They come with uh, like the writing activities, running records. So you can, like I mentioned at the beginning of a lesson, listen to them read and mark up how they do. So they come with a lot of extras as well to help you use them. Um, all you would need to do to be really able to start using them is to match them to whatever skill you're teaching in phonics. So if you're teaching short vowels, all you do is go to the bundle, say, hey, here's the short vowel section in the table of contents. You give them a book that has the short vowel that matches. So it's really easy to, you know, just make them work for whatever phonics program you're using. If you use my phonics program from sounds to spelling, which is separate, you do have decodable text already for sure. Some of our teachers also have the TPT bundles as well, just as a complement. They can work together perfectly. But again, these can really work with any phonics program. Amazing, Leslie, thanks for joining us. At least I think I answered your question. I'm just scrolling up and seeing if I missed any comments. You are so welcome, Gigi. Kimberly says you can get so much from kid watching, observing for carryover. Yes, you can. Awesome, awesome. Okay, you all, well, thanks for being here. If you do have any questions or you do think of something later, feel free to type it in a comment. Always happy to come back and answer. And remember that the decodable texts are discounted for just a couple of days. 
So let me know if you have any questions about those as well or how it might look different for kinder versus second grade because obviously there would be some tweaks. So let me know if you have any questions. I do hope this was helpful. Thanks so much for watching and have a wonderful rest of your day.